Okay, uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, Professor James, uh, Director of the Institute, Professor Jingu Kli, uh, Sanji Chan, and Sarah Petrosi, and my colleagues and dear participants. Uh, welcome you to this uh, one day workshop on harmonization of aging data around the world. Uh, when the LASI report and data was released last year in January, and a lot of people started using the LASI data, IAT is alone around 32 PhD scholars are working on their dissertation using LASI data, and of course in other places as well. So there was a need felt that if they want to compare the LASI data with uh, similar HR studies done in around 49 countries around the world, what are the ways in which this data can be harmonized and used more effectively? So many PhD scholars and young researchers felt that that is, that is very important and we need to do that. Now we also have a HRS type of study and data for India in the form of LASI. So uh, based on that request and need, we thought it is very important to have a workshop on harmonization of aging data around the world. And when we, when we are thinking about aging data and harmonization, I think uh, the first person come to our mind is Professor Jingu Kli. Uh, I think uh, I don't doubt to introduce Professor Jingu Kli to all of you. Many of you might have referred her a large number of research papers and publications. She is the director of the Global Aging Research and Policy at the University of Southern California. She is the professor of economics there and also the PI principal investigator of the harmonization of aging data around the world, which is supported by National Institute of Health. And she is also heading the, as a director, the gateway of aging data, which take care of uh, data from various HR studies. And many of you also know her as the principal investigator of the longitudinal aging study in India and also the LASI DAC, uh, Diagnost Diagnostic Assessment of Dementia in India. So uh, thank you Jinguk for spending your time and agreeing to come here and to be with us this day. And uh, so uh, I request uh, uh, Dr. Saran to present a bouquet to Jinguk. We have uh, Sandy Chan with us. Uh, she is the director of the data management at the uh, University of Southern California. Also directly dealing with LASI and LASI data. Many of you might have communicated with her. She has come to IAPS at earlier occasions also and uh, interacted with our team. So we are thankful to you for uh, spending, uh, agreeing to be here. And I request uh, Rufi to present a bouquet to Santi. We also have uh, Sara Petrosin, who is also dealing with the harmonization project as well as the LASI DAD project. So I request Akansha Singh uh, to present okay on behalf of all of us to Sara. Uh, so this program is organized on behalf of Center for Aging Studies and the short-term training program cell of IAPS. As you know, last year, um, we, uh, under the initiative of our director, Professor James, and with the approval of Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, IAPS started a new center called the Center for Aging Studies. And uh, we also have a large number of there are few participants from outside, so for their knowledge, major studies going on here, like the longitudinal aging study, study on global aging and adult health, 
and various other projects on aging as well as large number of scholars working on aging issues. Uh, so we are very happy to organize on behalf of the Center for Aging Studies. So let me thank our resource persons, Professor Lee, Sa Sandy and Sarah for agreeing to be here and ready to spend their one full day with us. We have a very scheduled, very uh, tight program today. I think the agenda is already with you. And we will be also sharing some of the presentations and materials uh, to you uh, through online. So now I request uh, Professor James for this uh, uh, director of the institute for this uh, opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shekhar, Jinko, <laughs> Sandy, Sara and my colleagues and the participants. And good morning and welcome first to IAPS, those who are not from IAPS, I think majority of you appears to be from IAPS, but there are also, I understand that, tens participants from outside. So it's wonderful to have this harmonization data training program today here. Because as you understand, you know, there is also a large emphasis, I was talking today morning with Jim Cook, there's also a large emphasis with the national education policy, etc., in by the government of India on internationalization of our education. Because as you know, all our universities and all the PhD scholars in India only work on Indian data. Because India is so huge, so we have perhaps many countries combined together here within India. But at the same time, it's also very important to understand what is happening outside India. That's why it's always good to also examine you know, these data which is there outside and you know, but in that case we need data which is comparable, which can be measured with almost in a same uh, definitions as well as all other characteristics which we expect from a data. So that's why the LASI data which is harmonized with HRS with all other countries which is happening in 42 countries or 43 countries the, of the world, it is very easy for these research scholars or even the scholars really to examine these data and then analyze it for better understanding of what is really happening in the field of health, in the field of aging, and also in other related areas. So it's good that Jim Cook has agreed to come over with a team to really teach this. I thank for TV Shaker and the entire center for taking this initiative for organizing this training program. And I am sure all of you will immensely benefit for, to understand what are the data systems in each of these countries available and also to appreciate what is really happening across the countries so that we can also take very informed policy decisions on the issues of aging and health. Thank you once again and have a very fruitful deliberations and training program for the day. Thank you. First of all, I want to extend my thank you to Dr. T.D. Shaker for having us on today's workshop and organizing um, here. And I really appreciate Dr. James' um, support for this LASI project as well as our initiative to work together to learn more about population aging and its implications around the world. It will be a great pleasure to work with you um, because there are so much data that um, you can utilize and take advantage. It's at your fingertips. In that regard, I want to also thank my team, um, Ms. Sandy Chan and Sarah Petrogen, to come out here. Not only coming out, but really preparing the program for you. So you will have today hands-on experience of how to work with this data, starting from what kind of resources are available, how you can find them, navigate the systems, and then download the data, learn the analysis, and with a lot of different examples. So by end of today, you will be equipped with a knowledge that how you can search for different data sets, how you can conduct your analysis, and what would be various resources you can take advantage of. 
So hopefully uh, with this day forward, you can take advantage of uh, various data set, not only the last um, data, which is homegrown, but also together with other um, various international data sets. And thanks very much for finding time today and spending one day with us. Hopefully it will be a productive time for you two years to come. Thank you very much. Now we will start our first technical session. Over to Professor Jingu. Environmental studies around the world, as well as the um, dementia study, which is built upon the health and retirement studies. So, as many of you know, the world older population is growing really rapidly. So, in 2010, global population ages 60 and older is just over 1 billion, but this is going to be almost like 2.5 times by 2050. It's a remarkable population structural changes. It has a lot of implications for the society, as well as individual families around the world. And what is most interesting is where this population aging is happening. So if you look at um, this graph, you can see the share of total population age 65 and over by different parts of the world. And you can see all different around the world and ranging from European countries, US, India, and Africa, all around the world, population aging, and the share of older population is increasing. But look at the blue line. The blue line here is showing the steepest in increases in older population. That's this Asian countries. South Asia especially is growing. Uh, population changes most rapidly, which brings the importance of the last study and importance of thinking about population structure in um, South Asian countries. So population aging is really a triumph of civilization, right? It used to be we all have very shorter life. The average life expectancy is of just around age 60. But things have changed completely. Now everybody is enjoying the much longer life expectancy, but the many questions came up with that uh, increased life expectancies. Is the increased life expectancy is also means healthy aging, or it's just like older people living extended period of time with the disabilities and other health problems. That is a serious issue, right? And if they cannot no longer work, then society has to support those older population. It used to be five workers support one elderly person. A country like Japan, they have life expectancy has been lengthened so much, now only two workers have to support the one elderly person. It has tremendous implication for the society. It's not only the number of working persons supporting, but think about the health expenditures. So most of the health expenditures are spent by older people in older developed countries. Now the, the cost is increasing so much, again creating a lot of fiscal burden to the society, and that's why many policymakers develop such a profound interest in population aging issues. And it's not only just understanding the issues, we need to find the solutions for these various problems. The importance of thinking about population aging is there are many other countries that has experienced population aging already. So countries like the US, countries like um, you know, Japan, many of the European countries already start dealing with this sort of population aging issues much earlier than in Asian countries. But the problem is twofold, right? We haven't really, the India has not really thought about population aging as much. But the population aging is happening so fast. So we don't have a lot of time. We have to come up with a solution very quickly. So I think that's why we want to really try to learn from other countries' mistakes. Many countries made a lot of mistakes. 
in creating the burden. I'm from US, right? US has spending so much money on health care. But still, the, a lot of um, Americans have worse health than Europeans, especially the young elderly. But if you look at all this old, Americans are doing much better than the European system. That's because of the American system, the, the care, once the disease developed seriously, they do provide better care. But when people are just developing the small health problems, they don't know how to, they are not dealing with it because health insurance are tied with uh, jobs, then it is not universal. So I think India has a lot to learn from the mistakes of other countries have made. So by looking at what has happened in other countries, you can make a solid suggestion for your, your government. So that's why the health and retirement study started. So it goes back a long time. The study of health and retirement study start, started back in 1992. And that was started with a very humble beginning. They only studied people with age 51 to 61, one birth cohort in 1992. And that was done by small group of economists and few geriatricians. So the study was only focused on health and um, economics. But as you know, our life is not just consist of health and economics. Our life is full of our family members interacting with the social society and participation. And how we feel about it you know, at the individual level also matters a lot when we think about the health outcomes. So the study start to um, develop paying attention to those other issues. Especially the study in uh, came in from Mexico was started in back in 2001. That study was very important to understand the immigrant health because they, there are a lot of back and forth between Mexico and US. So by bringing Mexico to um, comparing with the US, people have fun. Mexicans in the US have much better health than Americans living in the United States. And then later on, they found out that main reason driving that is the immigration health bias. The selection bias of only healthy Mexicans are coming to the US. It's not because Mexicans are better health, it's just a better health Mexicans coming to the US. So it brought up the, you know, make a huge contribution to the literature to better understand immigration health. In 2002 then, the new study came up in England. So the study is called English Longitudinal Study of Aging, and that was started exactly comparable to health and retirement study in the US. Because, you know, the, because of the history, a lot of the, you know, English men came to the US, right? So if we compare the Caucasian men in the US, comparing with the English men in England, there was a main motivation. So in the United States, National Health um, Institute of Health provided a lot of funding to England to make that um, English study to start. But of course, the British government also <coughs> trying to work with the US government and launch that project, which now we call it ERSA. But ERSA made a significant impact on HRS. Although it started in 2002, they brought a lot of innovations to the study that US study never thought about before. Two important innovations. The first innovation that ERSA study brought into the world was biomarkers. Mm -hmm. They are the first study sending the nurses to the communities, measuring height, weight, and they also collected a lot of information about um, their health conditions using biomarkers. They started the genomic studies first in England. So US health and retirement study previously focused only on a lot of the economics, not really thinking about health, they start to bring those health components to the US studies. And another important um, element that ELSA brought into the table was the uh, psychosocial aspect of it. So US study team did not even include the psychologist in the HRS studies. But ELSA study first started 
developing a whole instrument on psychosocial measures, measuring people's personality. And there has been a lot of findings. Personality matters in tests. Like those people who are more conscientious know how to take their medication on time, right? And they can take care of themselves much better. The conscientious people tend to be um, more um, better performance on the jobs because they tend to show much more diligence in the jobs. All of those studies have started with ERSA. And with that influence, the US studies now start collecting those information. So which is really interesting is whether all those measures, would that really also show the same patterns in other countries? I think those are really open-ended questions because nobody has really studied them yet, right? So what it would play out in different countries are really unknown. And um, after that, there are a lot more studies came in, especially the European countries, all the Caribbean studies, the Asian countries. I started a, a study called the Korean Longitudinal Study of Aging back in 2006, right after SHARE. There was first non-Western study, because even translation is hard, right? What we say in English, you put that in Hindi or Punjabi or Canada, the, how it really means the culturally could matter different things. And the systems are very different. But still, what we are trying to capture is really the process, the core concept, not so much of the world-to-world -world translation. That's not what we are caring about, right? What we are trying to care is, we try to understand what the retirement means, what the health means, how people are doing, and within the context, we're trying to understand that. In this graph, I'd like to show you this orange on the far, far right on your hand. That's India. That's LASI. Because the LASI with IAPS's uh, team's effort, we have interviewed over 72,000 respondents who are representative of this country, but also every single state and union territories around the, uh, all around the country. That sample size is the largest among all the HRS studies, and that really brings the new insight. Right now, we have only one cross-sectional wave, but you know, Dr. James and Dr. Shaker and I have been really working hard to try to um, make our study longitudinal, true longitudinal study. Then I think the world will learn from us because there are so much data that nobody has really tapped into to understand the um, aging much better. So I think it may be good to give you a little bit of um, idea of what are all these studies are really available. Because as um, Dr. Shaker and Dr. James mentioned, there are over 20 surveys around the world from 47 countries. So I think the first task is to, to understand what's available where, right? And this is also quite dynamic. Um, there are new studies under development too. So let me tell you um, a little bit about each of those studies. As I mentioned earlier, you learned about Mexican health and aging studies started in 2000. They already have conducted um, follow-up interviews. So you can see over changes of the Mexican um, health. Mexico is a very important country in the sense that um, Mexico and China, I would say, in comparison with India, because both of them are middle-income countries, right, developing very fast. So you can kind of share some of those common ground of uh, characteristics of middle-income countries. Um, I think it will be very interesting to see how the regional changes look like among the Mexican population compared to it. Once we have a panel data available in India, um, as well. The share was a um, big advancement because um, the share director, Professor Axel Boshi Supan, started the European study. He only started with the 14 countries around Europe. But then they brought in all the European countries under share umbrella, as well as Israel. So it has a you know, very large sample, like LASI, and they are harmonized in the sense that even though there are so many different countries, the 
you know, the starting from European countries, like uh, Southern European countries, like Italy and Spain, ranging to Scandinavian countries. They use single instrument and then translate it. Very sim similar to our Lassie model, right? We started with one, with one um, instrument and then translate that into different uh, states. So Cher takes a very similar approach. Cher brought in very important innovation to HRS, which is called life history interview. So life history interview is when we interview people, right, in Lassie, we interview people at age 45, and we try to borrow them over time. In the ELSA or um, HRS, interview starts at age 50. But if you think about it, Life doesn't start at age 50 or age 45. Life starts when we were born. So what, um, but it is impossible for um, the birth cohort studies to grow older because then it takes you know, 50 years to, to see the aging process. So as an alternative, what Cher has developed is they developed a life history interview, retrospective life history interview. So basically what, we are, what they have done is showing their life calendar and ask them what they were life were like when they were childhood, when they were in young adulthood, and when they were when they get for smart job. Our memory gets old, right? So it's very hard to remember all of this. So there might be a lot of biases. So in order to overcome that, what they have done is actually giving the anchor mark both external event, like um, you know, there was a um, big tsunami or there was a COVID, mm -hmm. right? Those are important um, events. Then people kind of understand, oh, I was like before the pandemic, my life was changed because of pandemic. Or people sometimes give the internal landmark features, mm -hmm. like when the first child was born, when you got your first job, or when you're parent passed away. So by providing those anchor points, helping people to understand what their life was during that time, and trying to create their life histories and see how early life influences made our life outcomes. That becomes a lot more important. If you look at the literature nowadays, in sociology, economics, or health, doesn't matter. Everybody is talking about life course approaches. And trying to capture that early life is really important. And that's one of the things that you know, Shaker and I talked about, bringing life history to the uh, LASI as well. I think we can aim to do that in wave three once we uh, finish up our first follow up. But it will be very good to get to those retrospective life interviews. So in survey like SHARE, they actually start with a retrospective life interview and get to know what the respondent's life is, and then they build on their um, interviews after that. A lot of older others, whether they are in India or Europe, they like to talk to interviewers, because you know they get lonely, right? And <laughs> sometimes they, they really enjoy the company. So I think those are very important um, uh, features that we can um, provide. There are so many studies, I can talk about hours on each of these studies, but probably I should move on to the next set of slides, and if we have a little bit of time left, and you can tell me which survey you want to know more about, then I can tell you more about that. So all of these studies, I think there are very important key characteristics that you need to understand and thinking about these surveys. Very important aspect of all of HRS study is its population representative. This population representative is important, especially if you want to make a policy recommendations. You want to say something about your your government. What should be the intervention that government should be thinking about in order to make that important implication, draw the implication, population representativeness is very important. The other one is longitudinal. We want we are not just interested in cross-sectional findings. What we want to understand is the changes, how people's life changes when we get older, right? So that can be only achieved when you conduct longitudinal interviews. And when we do that, it's very important to follow the same people so we can observe the changes with the same people. 
So if you look at any of the HRS studies, you can track the people, and especially in like HRS study, we started back in 1992. We follow people, and when people get divorced, we follow both spouses, right? We have seen some of the, our spouses get divorced and they get remarried to the same spouses. And you can track all of those and kind of see um, how those marriage dynamic influences people's everyday life. All of these studies are multidisciplinary because again, our life has um, very multiple dimensions. So many studies, all of these studies are doing that. And all HRS studies have a coordinated instrument. So we call harmonizing instrument is very important. You know, that will allow us to do cross-country analysis. And these studies have um, high quality comic data. In comic data is very hard. Um, you know, asking somebody consumption, income, and asset is very difficult. Usually people would mind talking about, complain about their health or headaches, right? They would be happy to do that. But people don't want to talk about how much money they make. So it's very hard. So the way that we try to overcome that is when we ask how much money you make per month, people are reluctant. But we follow up. Do you make more than what 10,000 rupees, 50,000 rupees? People can say yes or no. That's a lot easier to answer. So that's how we approach it. Right? So we follow up with a couple of uh, up to three questions trying to get that people's income. And that provides a very high quality economic data that we're um, utilize. High quality economic data is also very hard to utilize. So later when uh, we have our data workshop, Sandy can tell you more about how to deal with those economic data. But our team also process those data already. So many of the you know, disciplines wouldn't care how we clean up the data or how we construct those data. So we could um, provide those already processed data to the um, research communities. So we can tell you about how we process the data and how you can get at those cleaned economic data. And then the biomarker data is another important landmark. And all these studies are trying to get a biomarker data. Some uses venous blood sample, some uses dry blood specimen, some uses performance measures. But again, we try to calibrate um, dry blood samples with the venous blood sample because the, even though the assays are good, calibration is very important. Because when you make a lab test, you want to talk to the doctors how this blood sample, you know, HbA1c level, how that would translate to the, if you go to the hospital and get your blood drawn and get the measures. So um, all of these studies have integrated those and making it. And the other important thing is making it publicly available. So we provide all the code on our website, you know, it's all for you to grab. There's nothing to be secret about. So whatever we did, we make it available on our website. And you can use it, you can take a look at it. All the data is on the website. So we have various countries' data. You just need to register it, and then you can download the data, and then you can use it. Nothing else is needed. You don't have to pay a dime or a one rupee. That. It's all free. So, because we built this data using taxpayers' money, public funding, so none of this is not our own property. So you can just use it. I think as we talked about it, all the HRS studies um, tackle common research questions because we are all thinking about how to help the government to address the population issues around the world. But all of these studies really try to capture relevant information within the country because systems vary so much. You know, we cannot just use the same instrument that I used in Korea or US. This is India. We cannot use that. 
So we need to really translate that, try to capture the programs that's relevant in this country. And we worked very hard with IITS team, particularly worked hard on that. But let's think about what it means by tackling common research questions. All of the studies want to study aging and return on process. What that means is we have to really capture the population before they start return on process. So some of the countries have early retirement ages, or they have a shorter life expectancy. Then we interview them at age 45 instead of age 50. Mm -hmm. But once India becomes um, richer and life expectancy gets longer, then maybe future last survey in wave five, we may consider it to start from age 50 at that point, right? There's nothing magic about age 45. It just you know, picked up based upon that um, process. And because we are doing um, longitudinal survey, we adopted cluster design, trying to keep the cost low. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be too expensive and impossible to trace people. And because if we, want, if we are interested in trends, then it is very important to have population representative sample in every round. But that is very expensive. So none of these studies do that. So like in the US uh, health and economic study, we usually refresh the sample in every six years because the original recruiting becomes so expensive. On the other hand, in order to study individual trajectories, we follow the same people. And we try to make sure we follow individuals wherever they move because Movers usually have a different characteristics. They are either healthier, as we talked about, the Indians in the US or Mexicans in the US, they are healthier, or people move to the other family members, meaning they have larger families. So whatever the characteristics is, we want to follow where people move and try to understand uh, their trajectories. Nowadays, a lot of people are very interested in health disparities. We see a lot of disparities between gender, social economic status, right, different race and ethnicity. Health disparity is a very important issue. Urban rural differences, really important issue, right? So we need to make sure we, if there are minority sample, all these studies oversample those minorities in order to speak about health disparities. Health disparities are a very important topic, and I think all of you can study. And you can think about, you will see the real consistent pattern, whether you are looking at minorities in England or minorities in India, you will see same sort of disparities in, in this world. And we all study impact on policies and programs. So there, what I, especially many of you are young scholars, what I would recommend you to do is, you look at papers that's already published. Just choose the topic later on. Sarah will show how you can do that. But if you have a particular topic that you are interested in, just read a paper that is already written using MS, using HRS, and start from there. They will give you a really good template that you can start from, and then use that template for Indian data when you try to use, uh, try to answer the same research questions for India, using Indian data, and look at the data, right? Whether it's a health disparity or retirement process, you can do that. It will give you somewhere to start, because when, I remember when I first started my own dissertation and writing paper, writing first paper is the most difficult job, right? It gets easier all the time, but writing first paper is very difficult. So when you write your first paper, don't try to come up with, uh, you know, come up with a topic from the air. That's too hard. Just read the literature, pick a paper that you like most, high impact paper, right? And use that for India. I think that will give you a very nice first paper. And after that, you will have more idea as you come along. So, um, especially when you look at the policies and programs, many of these countries' data have been used to study policies and programs, impact of programs. So you can evaluate program effectiveness, policy impact within this country by looking at other countries' examples. 
And then nowadays there is a lot of interest in dementia because dementia is the number of dementia is prevalence is increasing, people living with the dementia is increasing. The cost of it, uh, dementia, economic impact of dementia is so high, it's uh, more than Apple, more than Google. So there has been a lot of uh, funding opportunities, scholarship opportunities, so it's a good area to study. And we have a uh, Lassie Dad study, which is built upon Lassie study. So I welcome all of you to work with those Lassie Dad data. And that is also available um, on our website. And when we try to bring the, um, try to capture the, those important research questions, the last E, what we have done, what IIPS team has done is bringing a lot of local experts to get their advice. We invite government to hear what matters to them, what they wanted to know, and then we try to test our instrument many times to make sure it's working and then, but still, we have to struggle a lot looking at, um, because we have to work with 18 different languages, different reality and policies. Politics matters, right? We go to Muslim environment that's very different from Hindu environment. We have similar experiences in Israel, in you know, different countries. So we have done that, but I think even there, if let's say you are a scholar with a lot of interest in methodology, one of my colleagues right now have looked at interviewer effect, look at hypertension prevalence in India, in Mexico, and in the US, because they think interviewer, how interviewer do their job may matter when you measure your blood pressure, right? We measure three times and we get the average scores. But they, everybody uses different equipment. Different administrator may have a different impact. You can do a methodology study and see how much of the interviewer effect uh, have implication on hypertension prevalence. When I heard my colleagues at Stanford doing the study, I was very nervous because it would look bad on us, right? If our interviewer have so much impact on our hypertension prevalence matters, then you know, our data would look bad. So I was like, at, at the beginning, I refused it. I don't want to do this study. But then I thought it would be better for my team to look at it. Because if somebody else pointing the fingers to us, that's even worse. So we got involved and we looked at it and our data looked very good. So Shaker, congratulations to <laughs> And also Saram, you, you guys did a wonderful job. And we are writing that paper now saying that uh, the quality of our interview was so good. The bias the interviewer linked to the data is really minimal in India. So many people can write that sort of methodological paper too. So. It, I think it's a lot um, very important to think about science in a very narrow, specific manner. So you can write a, a paper in a timely manner, because number matters, as you know. So as we talked about a lot of things, worldwide HRS provide panel data we talked about. It provides rich biomarker data. We talked about rich life history data. And one other thing that I haven't talked about it is end of life data. So in the US and, and many other countries now, people worry a lot about long-term care because the children move out of parents' homes. Who will take care of the elderly, right? Institutions are built up, but nursing homes are very expensive. Old age homes are very expensive. And elderly often wants to stay their homes rather than going to the institutions. So it's a very controversial area of research, long-term care. So what end-of-life interview do is when we found out that respondents passed away, we interviewed their family members and asked about their circumstances around death, how they take care of the cause, what was experience like at the end of their life, who take care of those people, mm -hmm. and how what kind of health care they have utilized. So that is end of life data, and we have those end of life data in um, various countries. And we are also collecting that data for last year for our second wave. 
And we have a um, very in-depth cognitive test data from um, our dementia studies. So I'm gonna just touch briefly on each of the data we talked about. So panel data, it has uh, different dimensions. As you can see, all the HRS panel data includes demographics, health, health care utilization, health behaviors, the wealth data, income, consumption, family and social network data, employment and retirement. You have this data from 47 countries around the world that you can use. Biomarker data, we have most of the countries have anthropometry data. So like you can study obesity. Obesity is really good topic. Everybody is interested in obesity. But what I found um, in India, important to think about, you need to show the double burden, which is very unique. And I think it's a great research topic. You know, you have a lot of population underway. At the same time, you also have very large population obese and overweight. There are not many countries have those kind of double burden. You cannot just focus on obesity. In many of developed countries, they only focus on obesity. But if I'm writing a paper in India, I would look at both. And that data is available for, for you to use. And there's a lot of uh, good, um, data performance measures. People look at grip strength, time to walk. Many of people use those data to write frailty. So you can do that. Blood assay data is available. And many new countries now also make genetic data available. So there are different genetic structure. I mean, I think most of you are social scientists now. So social scientists now also use genomic data. Instead of going to the raw data, what they use is what we call it polygenic risk score. So what it does is it capture all the genetic, um, create a single index score of showing the endowed genetic characteristics of, for example, your endowed characteristics of cognition, endowed characteristics of risk of um, you know, obesity, and so forth. So if you use that, then you can just use as a one variable without knowing a lot of genetics. But there is a field is growing on social scientists using genomics because that's, you can use it as an instrument right because it's not confounded with other um, factors so that is uh, one of the advantage of using those data and then the retrospective life history data is available from hrs ersa share charles and closer you can have my slide so you know you don't need to worry about it so for the life history interview data you can get the whole job history of when people stopped, you know, changed their jobs, how much they earned between different jobs. You can see people's medical histories. You can see how the child, the, when the first one was done, how much of interval was there, whether you know giving a birth to a child, how that is related with their uh, work patterns, for example. A lot of interesting people you can see, you know, having a, for example, being a first child has a positive impact on male's labor force participation. When first born, uh, child is born, men feel more responsibility, right? So they go back to work, they work harder. On the other hand, a lot of women take a break they have to take care of the young ch child at home. So you see the complete vivid pattern on that. And over time, many of the women come back to the labor force, but even within Europe, we see such a big difference. The French women <coughs> tend to stay at home much more than the, you know, the woman from um, Germany or in Netherlands. And you can relate that to what would be the, um, like, um, the pension income the government provide? How much of the maternity rate government provide? So like, there's just so much potential you can do with those kind of uh, rich life history data, right? And this data is already um, in a very easy to use format. So you can see at what way age they were employed. So we call it the sequential data. So at individuals at each age, what is their medical status, their, what is their working status, what was their health like, 
whether they have a house or they were renting an apartment, you can have all of the data um, again in this number of countries. The Korean data only has a job history, but the um, ELSA and SHARE has the richest data. If I were you, if you're interested in using life history, you know, ELSA and SHARE has the best data. So I would use those. HRS did not have utilized calendar method. They just use the mail questionnaire, so data is a little bit more lesser quality. And charts, we are working on it. So the you can use charts life history data, but it's not it's a little bit more difficult to use. But we are working on making data a little bit um, easier to use. So when that time comes, you can also look at the China data as well. We talked about um, end of life interview data already. And I have written a few papers looking at the place of death, where people die really very a lot. You know, whether they die at the hospital, you know, whether they go through um, the end of life devices, how the end of life decisions are made, those very a lot. And it has so much implications and how government structure those and what kind of subsidy they give to the families and caregivers change people's life experiences, right? At the end of life, how they live that last year of their life. I lost my parent a few years ago. I mean, it was quite an experience. And you think <coughs> twice about, you know, what it would be like and how those most important days of their life is uh, spent. It's so much tied with how government structured hospitals, long-term care insurances, and so forth, which is amazing, right? In the US, for example, there is a maximum um, nursing home stay of 30 days. So if somebody stayed in the nursing home in 30 days, and in order to have a financial benefit, um, many of the people get discharged and then re-enter it, just for the, because the system is set up that way. In other countries, like Italy, there is no nursing home. So the, the daughters typically take care of their parents in Italy. So they just withdrew their job and stay home to take care of their parents. It is really interesting to think about how these uh, you know, programs are related with the people's lives. And not only older people's lives, because also younger people's lives. <laughs> As a parent to child, you have to care for your parents. So it has a lot of implications, whether government provides the allowances to your parents, whether government provides the services to your parents, really has a lot of significant impact on young people's life. So I think these are important things you can um, also study. So now, um, finally, the cognition data. So the age gap data started back in 2016. So this is really trying to leverage on existing longitudinal cohort. And it all used the same set of batteries. And it also interviewed the family members to learn about um, what would be like, uh, to learn about the cognitive status and activity limitations of the parents. And all these studies are aimed to um, estimate the dementia prevalence, but more importantly, the risk factors and how we can prevent. Right now, it, despite there has been so much investment has been made, there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. There is no cure for dementia, but if we can delay the onset of dementia, or we can just like having, making them to develop such syndromes one year later, two years later, that makes such a big society, societal impact, both in terms of money, but in terms of the family burden. So it is a very important research question that you can study. And by, because we are building this data on the panel data, on top of panel data, we have so much information about these people already and their families that you can study. So this is where, um, the data is available. So, um, so far, there has been um, this dementia study funded in the United States, Mexico, England, China, and India that 
we we are currently launching our second wave of last event. Uh, Shaker came out for our launch event last Monday. We are training the interviewers right now, trying to send them to the field for the second wave. Um, but there are also other studies in Chile, South Africa has a small study. Um, also, SHARE is doing five countries in SHARE, not every country, but Germany, France, Italy, Czech Republic, and Denmark. They are doing a um, dementia study right now. And also, Ireland and Northern Ireland are currently in the field of collecting their data. And in, from Caribbean countries, we have uh, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, and Cuba. Those three countries are collecting, conducting dementia study. And I'm involved in doing a study in Kenya. So as you can see, many different countries around the world. And there are a few studies um, completed, actually two studies completed their second wave. Um, Mexico and South Africa. There you can already see dementia incidence, but in other countries, you um, just begun doing the second wave in uh, US and, and China and India and um, South Africa. Because there are so much data. You heard about me talking about so much data. It will be almost like too much, right, for you to look over all of those. So um, <laughs> what we, our team, the Gateway to Global Aging team has done is um, providing this data, helping you to navigate this. So we provide key information about each of these surveys. What do the samples look like? How they recruited that sample? Where is the questionnaire? How, what would be the data collection protocol, how you can get the data. So we provide that information on our website. Um, so if you come to our website, that will help you get to those information. <laughs> Although all of those, this data set, are um, having, capturing the same concept, as we talked about it, every survey made oh. modifications. And those modifications is very important to note when you run the analysis. So we provide a search engine helping you to compare how the questions are translated differently, how it was framed differently in order to accommodate those cultural and societal differences. So you can do that. We have also written some user guide and uh, summary concordance table, which Sarah will um, tell you more in the next section. We then have um, harmonized data profile. So harmonized data is the clean analysis data. So it combines all the longitudinal data. So you don't have to um, link multiple data set. So it's all in a single data file and you will Later this afternoon, Sandy will show you how you can uh, take advantage of those uh, data files. And we also have publications website, so that kind of allows you to choose a topic, choose a study, and identify all the relevant previously written papers. So you can see and set from there. We organize a lot of webinars and, um, and usual workshops like this. So. And we keep all our previous user webinars and workshops on our website. So you can see the videos of what we have done. And you can also just download the code that we provided as a part of the workshop. So many of those examples you, you will have on access. And we have a, a help desk. So if you have specific questions, you can just write to our help desk. And we're trying to provide an answer to those questions as well. So all of these features um, Sarah will provide, and I really thank your um, attention. It's been great to meeting you today, and I, I would be happy to um, answer any questions you may have before our tea break. I think we have about seven minutes left, right, Shaker? Yeah. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, please. My name is 
Sanjal Mishra, I am doing PhD here. My question is about last C section, uh, weakness data. Why we are asking some names randomly to the respondent? We select uh, some common male and female names from the given list of names. What is the use of that? Oh, you are talking about the PMIET data, right? Yes, yes. So the use of that data is when we ask um, people's subjective feelings, a lot of times it gets biased if we frame it to um, yourself or respondent themselves. They wanted to answer which would be comply with the social norms. So by putting another random person's name, it provides the distance. So I can say, oh, what would be you supposed to be doing? So like for example, um, caregiving burden. A lot of times we ask about caregiving burden. Many people say it is daughter's duty or daughter-in-law's duty. So I would not say it would be stressful, but if we frame it differently, if so and so, uh, Gita has to provide the care. It is just like third person, you are answering for third person. People provide honest answer. So that's the main reason why we provide those random names when we ask those kind of uh, questions that would be associated with societal norms. Thank you. So first, for today's agenda, I'm going to uh, first intro do some introduction of the country, that, um, the data we will be using. And then I will introduce the research question who will guide today's analysis. Next, uh, I will show you how to create a combined data set. The last, we will do the, some cross-country analysis and exercise. So first, the introduction and research question. So um, Sarah already showed this, and then so you, she already explained all the these three study. So we we'll, today, um, as I mentioned, that we are using uh, these three middle income country as our uh, cross country analysis. The reason we use this is uh, based on 2021 World Bank definition. So um, there are two tier of middle country, uh, middle income country. Uh, one is lower middle and one is upper middle. The Indian is one of the lower middle country, and then the Mexico and China actually are the upper middle. So using these three countries is a um, good comparison. So um, as Sarah already showed, so on the Gateway website, you can find more information about these three studies. Let me switch. So this is our gateway website, as you probably already, um, since you, I think most of you already uh, registered as a user. So in this website, as Sarah shows, so here we have a study overview. I hope you can see, let me increase the font a little bit. So in this study overview, we can see we list out all the study here. And then uh, today we are going to use the NHAS, and then Charles, and Lassie. And when you click the study here, you will see all the study detail. So we have a sampling frame, we have a how the data collection uh, time frame, and then we describe the sample, how many samples they collect. And then so and then also provide a link to download the data, and then this is the data access. So it's it will be same for all the three. You can play around and then see when you click the last, it will be the same, and also for the charts. So this is a study overview. introduce to today's research question. So it's actually, it's a caregiving burden and a med care need across India, Mexico, <coughs> and China. It's actually one of the, um, the, the attendees just brought up during the first session of the, our morning session. So now I'm going to show, since we are going to use three countries of a data set, so I'm going to show you how you can access 
and download those harmonized data set and then create the combined data set. So these are the steps. So first, we are going to download the three harmonized data set and then we will identify the relevant variables. And then um, next we'll combine all three data set into a analysis data set. And last we'll create some variable and then run some analysis. So first, let's download the harmonized LASI. So you will do, uh, you, will, you will just download the file as I mentioned to you while we are doing it. So you will go to the G2Aging website. So go to the website. So under the download tab here, you will click on download the data. And then let's first download the LASI. So here you can see we have different first color. First row is linked to the download survey data. Second one is the uh, instrument <coughs> construction. And then third is the download. So you will click the link here. It should show you, direct you to this download page. So I want to explain to you. So this is the last download page. On the first, the, the upper page is the last raw data. So I think you probably already have access to the uh, last raw data because IIP has also provide this raw data to all the students here and also provide to all the research community. And then, so in here, we also provide in our gateway website. So we also provide a whole different format, so it provides data, SAS, SPSS, and R. But in this data package, uh, we, we separate out three data files, uh, cover screen, household, and individual data, including a biomarker. And then questionnaire, we also add a user guide, and then we also create a raw data codebook. The raw data codebook is just like showing the basic frequency for all the raw variable. So probably you guys are already familiar with the data set. Now, you will love this data set. So we mentioned about the harmonized LASI. So this data set, uh, as Jinko and Sarah mentioned, is a user-friendly, um, clean version of the data set. And this file contains all the summary measures. We already cleaned the file for you. You don't need to do any linkage. And then um, all the variable has been cleaned. And then we provide a code book. I will show you later. And then also we provide a data code. How we create each of the variable in each of the session. So you, if you want to use a different definition, or our definition is not really comparable with your research topic, you can use our code and then change it and then make it as your own. So that's a good thing we provide. So have I, have, so everybody will just click the link here and then download it. So you see, you will download a data package down there. So anyone have trouble downloading the data? You can raise your hand and we will help you. Since later on we are going to run some data program and then, so it's important that you have access to data set. So I assume everybody already downloaded the data. So now we'll move on to download the Mexican data. Mm. So we cannot, uh, for downloading other study data, we cannot give you the data set. You need to register as a study user. Then you will download it from their website. So here is the website you can download. So the website here, the other way to do it is also go back to our download page. When you click the download here, let's look at the MHAS. Here's the link to the download survey data. If you click this link, it will bring you to the Mexican, the MPAS study. And first, you will be you will register as a data user. So let's register here. <coughs> do you go? Do you find this page? Oh. So you are typing all the information here, and mm -hmm. you will sign up as a user. You can raise your hand if you have any question. If you, don't worry if you really have trouble downloading or access a data file. Um, I will share an example just for today's workshop purpose. 
I create a subset like 100 observations for each of the data set, and then you will still get a chance to practice our data program. So when you're back home, you can go back here, since we will share the slide, and then you will download the real data, and you can uh, still run the code. So you see already as a registered user, for me, I just log in. to log in? No? <coughs> Good. Some people are already logging. Good. Very good. So as I mentioned, um, don't worry about it. if you really cannot access, I mean, download the file right now. So later on, I will, I mean, I think uh, we already as IT just to put the example data set on the server. And then when I finish all the exercise, uh, accessing the data, um, you guys will have access to that, the, the sample data set. And then so you will still get a chance to practice the data program. So as, so as soon as everybody already um, logging to this, um, the MHAS study website. So where you can find our harmonized data set. It's under this data product. We click on this. And then here is a harmonized data page. So again, you click on the data product. And then click on the harmonized data page. So this page will show up. And then here, it's hard to see. So our harmonized MHAS data file are here. So we provide a harmonized data file. Again, we create, we, we provide a data creation code. We also accompany with a code book. And then um, as we show on the uh, gateway website, we create an end of life harmonized file. This contains all the end, end of life data sets. So end of life more like exit data. So when the respondent die, the uh, interview will go back to ask the, fam the respondent family, the Z respondent family, to ask him a bunch of questions. So it's called an end of life survey. And we're also working with the uh, uh, MHAS team. We are going to uh, create a harmonized MESCA. So MESCA is an HK study, part of the HK study, just like the last data and then the HRS HK. So it will be available soon. So any questions so far? Okay, so let's move on to download the third data set. So again, let's go back to the download page here. So we already download the MHAS, we download the LASI, now we are downloading the Charles. So in here, Charles, you will click on the link to the survey data. So let's click here. So now you can see this is a child study website. To sign up, just click the sign up here. And you will click the yes. I agree all turns. So you can provide all your information on this page and then register as a user.
Yeah, someone told me it may take a couple of days. Sometimes the Charles um, team approved the registration really fast, but sometimes it take a couple of days. So I just want to let you guys at least you submit it and then wait for the data come come to you. And then they will send you an email notification that you are the registered user. So for those of you who have trouble, um, like cannot get the data right away, so you can log into the training um, computer here, and then uh, we. Okay, you go ahead. Okay, uh, please open your computer and uh, this uh, <coughs> ICT computer, and press Control plus R. Sorry, Windows plus R for the run. Everybody cannot get the child's data right away. So let's uh, get, turn on your computer and then to access this folder on the PC and then we can do the exercise together. Thank you. 
don't have credentials. Yeah, I don't have. But uh, I if computer have credentials. Oh, okay. Okay. Anyone had trouble to I said there's a folder called um, something workshop. Did you see the folder? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then you see that should have three folder in there. Who who already have I said can you raise hand? If you, you have to go to this folder named H underscore AG underscore workshop. Yes. So if your neighbor doesn't have access, you help your neighbor. So raise a hand if you still don't have access. Copy that folder into desktop and then you can access the data. No, they have data file. No, uh, they have data file. Can you mail the document to... Oh, it's in a mail? No, it's in a server. IPS server. I, I, I already checked here in that laptop. Do you have their email? No, I'm 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 saying only for the, this uh, training purpose. What? This same data she is saying it has. Okay, those who are having mail, they can access through mail. Those who are not having, they can access from this. Oh, okay. So, okay. so who doesn't have the the three folder? Who doesn't have the folder of the data? How about this? Okay. Uh, no, no, yeah, no. because I... So get it from your email or get it from here. Yeah, Whatever, either way. Get that to the folder. Yeah. yeah, either way. Either way. You got an email or using this way. <laughs> Who doesn't have the access to the three folder I create? <laughs> okay, everybody has that, so let's yes. move on. Perfect. Let's move on. Okay, now, next step is to identify the relevant variables. Now I'm going to ask a question to see whether you guys pay attention or not. First, since we are working on these three data set, right? And then we show a, a many times that what's the year this three study has been conducted interview. So now we want to see the most recent year for those three study will be our year of interest. Is anyone know which year will be our year of interest? 2018. Okay, I hear 17. I hear 18. So who think it's 2017? Okay, we have two people here. Who think it's uh, 2018? Very good, we have more people on 2018. Any other question, any other answer? I mean, it's based on the last year, this year, last year, annual data. Because we are comparing three countries, and we may, need to make sure we need to include those three countries. So last year, have only one year. So we will be taking that year. That's correct answer. Let me show you how we define, how to find that year. So if you go to the our gateway website, so you click on the core interview, and then it will show on this column, we show which year of the survey has been conducted. So we are interested in the most recent, right? And then you know, for the Mexican MHS study is 2018 to 19. And then for the Charles, we have a 2018 to 19. But in the last year, actually it's overlaid this last two row because if you know, we are starting on 2017 and then continue to 2019, right? So the correct answer is 2018. So 2018 will be our year of interest. Very good. 
So let's let's move on to the next um, question. So now we want to find the measure of the disability. So as you know, in the um, all the study, they collect the health um, measure, and then um, the two measure we'll be using today will be um, difficulty with activity of uh, daily living (ADL) and then instrumental activity of daily living. So those two are the the good measure to measure the um, disability. So let me show you how to find those variable from those study, from this three study. So there are several ways, that's just one way. So first, I'm going to show you the concordance on the top here, the concordance table. So here you see we have so many concordance, different topics. So like demographic, we have health, and then we have insurance, we have a cognition, we have the income and wealth here, and then we have family, the employment, retirement, so many, and it's really useful for your study. Let me, you, let me show the uh, functional limitation here, because this is show the ADL and IADL. Can you guys see, I can enlarge a little bit if you're hard to see. Is it better? Yeah. Okay. So let's look at the ADL. So in here, you see we have this out. So the, and also I want to mention the table is downloadable. You can download on the click here. So for the ADL, you see the M has, we have the difficult, difficulty of bathing, difficulty of eating, and then uh, getting out of bath and using toilet, and then walking across room, and then difficult dressing. For the child, we have almost the same, but we are missing one. The child did not ask the working a classroom. And then for the last year, we have all six. So for this, if we want to create a common variable across these three studies, how many can we have? Five. That's correct. So we were using the bathing, eating, getting out of bed, toilet, and then dressing to create a summary measure of the ADL. So this table really help you to identify what's the common across the, the different study. Okay, let's move on to the IADL. So sorry it's harder, so we don't um, have the first row show. But as you can see here, this is the IADL. And then we have managed money. So remember the second um, column is a Mexican one. So we have a difficulty of managing money, difficulty of taking medicine, we have a difficulty of, um, to do the grocery and then prepare the hard meal, but nothing else. So we only have four major in the MHAS. But the last two row is Charles and Lassie. And here you can see we have all the, the, the major that MHAS has it, we have extra. But in order to do the cross-country comparison, how many major can we have? Four. Yes. So later on, I will show you how to create so many major just using this four comma question. So very good. So I want to show, so this concordance table is really helpful if like you can find your, um, the, the interest topic and just go find the concordance table is related to the topic. And then I think someone is mentioning, <coughs> what are your other interests? Like family, I heard a lot of people are interested in uh, family transfer, uh, take care, involvement care. So you can look into this, and then we also create a lot of variable, and then you can do a cross country comparison. So you can, you guys can explore later. I mean, just like going to different, different topic, and then like look at different table, and then you can see we prepare a really comprehensive table to help you to do a cross country comparison. So in, a, in addition to the um, concordance table, we also prepare a U, the working paper theory. So in the paper, it describes even more in detail. So we describe how they are different across the study. And then not just listing out all the variable. And then we also look into the, the, the difference in uh, how they measure the, the um, how they measure the attendance measure. For example, for the physical measure, some of the study, I mean, most of the study use a different equipment. We list in this um, user guide. 
and then the cross com uh, comparison user that and you can see oh what's a, they use a different equipment and then they have a different standard and then so it will help you to understand uh, other study has been using so this is a concordance table so this is the first way you can identify your uh, variable for your um, cross-country analysis and then the next helpful function is search function so let's go back to the survey address and here we have the search function by the keyword search function by the subtopic in today's workshop we'll use the function as a subtopic because we know we want to look at the ADL and IDL so let's select the subtopic and then here we list out all the variable most of the variable that we already create as a harmonized measure so we have a demographic we have family in health you see we have an idea here so if you are not sure that um whether the what the variable call you can click the idl and then here the source you can pick the harmonized data that you are interested in. so let's do the harmonized and has and then you will click search so in here you see we list out the um the year here we are missing the most current one because we are still doing updating we just finished the wave five the 2018 one is not available right now but we are we will update soon but just give you an idea that why it was shown so when we do the ADLEC it shows the variable name here so the variable in the harmonized data is called R1 dress for the difficult addressing and then you show what's the uh, answer response here and then because they are uh, multiple ways, so you can we it's showing that R1 dress, R2 dress for all the different ways. So this is the second way you can identify the variable. And then there's a third way. Let's look at the harmonized code book. So this is the harmonized last code book. I think it's really, really helpful. And then you can spend a lot of time just looking to the variable um, you want to use. And then since um Probably you already work on the last raw data. You know how difficult to create a variable, even just create some demographic variable will take you like a couple of days. And then if you go into that income and wealth, because like normally like total household income or the total consumption will be one of the, uh, I would say, covariates will bring to your multivariate analysis. For those variables, it takes a lot of time just to create that total household income variable. And then also for the health measure, you need to create like doctor diagnosis. You always take time. But in here, we create a harmonized last data from here, and then it will, all the data variable has been cleaned. I'll show you what we have. And then I also want to highlight, in the harmonized last data, we do, we have two type of imputation already uh, conduct in the last year, uh, harmonized last data. So first, is the uh, imputation for the financial variable. It include the income, asset, and consumption. Because uh, as um, Dr. Lee mentioned that for the income and wealth, we use the um, bracket question. Asking whether, you, um, whether your household income is greater than certain amount, yes or no, whether over than certain amount, yes or no. And then for that, it's kind of difficult like, for you to compile and then create a total household income. And then, but we already done the job for you. So in the harmonized data, we take into all the bracket questions and then we follow, um, since it's not the first study that last year said, because starting from HIS, the US study, we use the bracket, bracket question for all the income and the financial variable. So we know what we need to do to, in order to get a total, um, total amount. So we follow the same strategy and then um, doing this imputation. So later I will show you in the code book, we already have a total household income already created, total um, the household wealth, and then also the total household consumption. Another imputation we perform is a commission variable. Because uh, in order to um, do some, we, know that we noticed some of the question in the commission section, um, the, the proxy will help out to answer the question. But it's hard if you have a lot of missing of your if you are going to use that variable in your analysis, you will drop a lot of sample. So we also, in our team, we have a um, researcher just to perform the imputation for the condition variable. So if you look at the harmonized last year data, we, we have less, almost no missing in here. And then, 
So it's a cup here. I will bring it bigger. So you see we have station A to station Q. So station A is the demographic. And then we create a lot of demographic variable. And then we also including the, uh, the weight in there so it's easy for you to use. We have individual weight, we have household weight. <laughs> and then we, we, create, we create a number of ho uh, household respondents. And then also we have age, gender, already clean. Everything is clean here. And then we have the year of education. And then we have all the marital status variable. So this is the um, demographic. And then for the health session, so since we are going to use the, um, the ADL today, so this ADL variable, you see, it's just a raw recall. And you can see the, oh, how to read. It's too light. But I think you should, uh, in the folder I share, there's a code in here, so you can look at your screen, it's more clear. So it just follow my instruction. So let's look at the health session. And then we have all the idea of raw recall. It's just the raw, the raw variable recall for this variable, for the idea. And then, uh, so we, uh, Sarah already showed you. So with this all the variable, we have a summary statistics. And if it's a categorical variable, we show the uh, categorical frequency. And then in the how construct session, we describe how we create a variable. And then we show the difference, and which, which also these are the raw variable. So this is the ADL, and then we have an IADL. And then for the summary measure we are going to use today, will be here. So as we already discussed, how many do, do you guys remember how many measure we are going to use to create this summary measure for the ADL? Very good. So you can see here. We have R1, AD, or 5 already created for you. So this is a measure already combined all the five uh, components we talked about. And then for the IDL, how many? Four. Yes. So we have the variable already created, R1, IAD, or 4. So those are the two variables we will be using today. And then to do the analysis, cross-country analysis. And same for the other uh, the Mexican study and the child study, they also have this similar, the almost the same question in the harmonized Lassi, harmonized Charles and harmonized and has. And I want to show more about the, our COBOL and then you can explore later. Like, um, so here is the condition session. So we have all the condition variable has been created. We have 0, 7, we have the date, uh, the orientation, date naming and location naming. And if you see here, since as I mentioned, we do the imputation for the condition variable. We also including a imputation frag. So this will show you what which observation has been imputed and which are the raw variable. So if you go down here, let's see here. So the first Variable showing here R one M O is um, the orientation for the um, uh, which month of today, and then you can see we only have seven o four is passy, and then all the other observation they don't have missing. But in the next variable here we have R one F M O underscore L. This is the imputation graph. So we have zero is not imputed. That means it's getting from the raw variable. And then the one is imputed, they are missing. And then four is if the respondent answer is refused. So and then also 13, just the proxy. So 11 is missing. We don't impute the proxy um, answer. So this variable will help you if you want to undo the imputation. <coughs> you think that oh, I don't, I want to, I will prefer to use the raw variable and I don't want to input any imputed value. You can use this uh, imputation for it to go back and undo the imputation. So this is just an example to show you what we have done for the harmonized data set. And then, as I mentioned here, is the financial variable. And then we have the, the variable, I mean, a lot of the researcher will use is the total value of financial essay, and then we have a total wealth here. So this is already 
we combine all the components of the question answering lastly. So if you look at how we construct it, it will say we take into account the as the uh, the asset for the primary primary house primary resident or the other resident and then the value of your land and then your agricultural equipment. So all the um, information already including in this total wealth variable. And then same for the income and consumption. So if you go down here, we have a total household consumption. And then we have the total household income. And then I think some of the, um, in the morning session, some people saying they are interested in uh, looking into the caregiving system. So here's the session. So in session L, So this variable is whether um, the responder receive any care based on their ideal idea. This is will be the variable we'll be using today in the workshop to um, to will be an indicator to see whether the caregiving is um, the respondent is a um, uh, um, man need. So you can you guys can go through this all the uh, the COBOL and all the variable we create. I think it's really helpful and. Uh, um, so it takes us a lot of time, I mean our team, to work on this and creating this harmonized uh, LASI data. So what else here? And then we also have a, a psychosocial variable. So as you mentioned to um, treat the, someone as him the CSD and then the CD. So we make a summary measure here and then we also describe how this variable um, was created. And this CD variable, we try to compare, I mean, our definition is try to comparable with the last year national report because we work together, I mean, with our team work together with the last year team. So the definition should be pretty comparable. So this is the harmonized last year COBOL. So I would suggest you, you just like, read through it and then find the variable you are interested in. And then if you have question, you can go also look into our code you can check out code if you saw anything, you have a question or you think something's wrong, you can let us know. And then we can work together and just improve our data set. Okay. So these are the three ways you can identify the variable, your research question. And then the next step is um, we will create additional measure. So as I mentioned, we will, we already, I already showed you the variable we see how um, we see. With ADL, IDL, and then we will use some of the demo. Today, we are also including some of the demographic variable, including age, gender, education, and urban and rural. So, I already show you this. So, this is a table, the variables. And these are all the variables we'll be using today. And then as I show you in the code board, you can see the variable for the harmonized LASI, it will be this R1 ADL5, R1 IDL4, R1 RCME, R1 AHY, R8 gender. And then uh, for the education, it's R-A-E-D-U-L-U-C-L. And then for the rural and urban, and then also the weight. So you can notice that some of the variable is not like, not really the same, for example, um, for the rural and urban variable for the harmonized LASI, it's double edge, it's not a single edge. Why? Any idea? So the reason is for the LASI, uh, we they are much, they may there are like more than one couple interview in the household. For all the other study, we only interview one couple in the household. But in the last year, we, I, I, based on what I'm seeing, like at least two or more couple are interviewed within the same household. So that's why we have an HH. So if it's more like the household level variable, we want to distinguish the difference with the other studies, so we put a double H in front. And then also you can notice that for the gender and education, it's not starting with the wave number. Like for the MPAS, it's R5 because we are using the wave 5. And then for the charts, we are using the wave 4. But for the age and gender, they are 
starting with RA. I think uh, Sarah mentioned that because this is a lifetime variable. You don't change your gender over time. You may, but like, <laughs> right? Yeah, and then for the uh, education, because uh, I think for, by the age 45, I don't think your education level will change. Who knows? But but those, that's the reason we put the A instead of a weight number, because it's a lifetime life. won't change the, the status variable. So, okay. So any questions so far? Now we are going to starting uh, looking at the theta code. So as I mentioned, our first step is um, automated move by itself. Okay, in the um, the folder, you should also see there's a PGM folder, so you will have the uh, program, something like this. So first we'll load the harmonized lossy data. So if you guys are already familiar with uh, data, it should be pretty straightforward. So we'll use, because in the lossy data, I mean harmonized lossy, we have a more than thousand variable we create. And then we don't want, sometimes we don't want to load the data, especially we are trying, right now we are want to do the cross-country analysis, we are going to load the three data sets. So we will only keep the variable we are interested in. So the first line here, we just keep the point key in wave one, and then all the variable we already list in the previous line. And then using is the, data, is the command we will just bring in the harmonized lossy data. Any question? And next step, we are going to append the harmonized MPAS data. So I'll bring in the second data set. What append did is like you have, right now you have record in data, this is a record for LASI, and append is bringing the second data file, append to the bottom of the data file. So those two data sets will be combined together. So here we just uh, append the harmonized uh, data set, and then again, we only keep in the variable we are going to use today. So the table we list in the, ta uh, in the table. And then we are generating a new variable called append. This indicator will show us like which data, the quick the record, quick, the record which data is coming from. And then we include a draw function here. Because as I mentioned, we only want to use the 2018 MHS data set. And the 2018 is a wave five. And then we have, a, in the harmonized data set, we always have this in wave, in I N W with the number at the end. It indicates which wave of the data has been collected. So in this case, M has is wave one. So we want to draw the record is not in wave five. So we have this draw if command here. And after we combine both data set, we want to create an indicator called country. That indicator was, was pretty important later on and because um, we want to know, after we combine all three, we want to know which record is coming from which country. So this is the recall command and then we recall the append variable we just created. And then in the append, it will show it's a zero and one we want to call, we want to recall as a one and two. So one, so can anybody tell me right now in the country variable, one is which country? So for the country variable I'm creating here, I recorded the append variable zero to one, and the one to two. So if you tap the country variable, one is which country? Yes, it's India. It's the first data set we bring in. And then two will be the second data set we bring in, will be the Mexican data. Got it? <coughs> okay, let's move on. So now we are going to bring the third data set, the harmonized chart. So it's almost the same command, we just bring a different um, variable, as I showed in the previous slide. And then the next 
statement is we are going to replace the country equal three if a pen equal one. So now the country equal three means China. And then in the last two, you can see we define this country variable and then one, two, three is showing here. And then we also assign the value label to that country variable. And then when you do a tab on the country, it will show as one, two, three as India, Mexico, and, and China. Do you guys have a data on your machine? Do you want to, yes. should we just try to run it? So I have the same folder as you guys, and then if you open the program, you can run the program called example underscore pgn underscore n100.do. So this program will run using the data I create for you, only the 100 observation. I also change the ID, I um, create a random value for the ID because um, it's just an example, I don't want to show the real ID for you guys. So let's open this up. For me, I just double click and then bring out the data. And then I'll just run this. So as you see here, we went through all the code here, we read in the last data, and then I do a quick check on the R1 ideal five to see, to see the frequency. And then also here we bring in the MHS data, and I tap the append, so I can, as you can see, append is zero and one, but assigned to one to two. And I put the pause. For you to get out of pause, just type exit. You will move to the next step, EXIT. So here it showed the, oh sorry. But probably you can see your screen, right? I'm sorry if you're not really clear, but it will show like one, two, three, and then I create a, 100 for each of the country. So now we are going to create some additional variable. So as I mentioned, the reason we create the country indicator is that when we create this combination, the summary measure, that we can use this country variable to identify the record, like which, um, which country that record is coming from. So because we know this study will be focused on 2018, so we create a variable to combine all the ADL variable together. Because for the Indian, it's R1 and then for the, Me the Mexican study is R5, and then for the China is R4. So in order to run the cross-country analysis, we want a one common variable. So that's how I create, so we say, we say gen, it's a generate new variable, R2018 ADL5, and it just keep replacing and using the, the variable from each of us study. And we'll do the same thing for the IADL. And then if you do a by country, that means we see the frequency by the three country and then to see the summary of the uh, ADL5 distribution. Am I going too fast or it's okay? So next we are going to do the same thing for the rule and for the rural variable. We'll see here, for the Indian, we have HH1 rural, and then for the Mexican, we have H5 rural, and then for the China, we have H4. And then we'll, we are also doing, doing the same thing for the H variable, H1. <coughs> So here for the age variable, I want to create a categorical because I want to see the different age group, the trend in the different age group, and then see, uh, later on you will see the different um, effect estimate by the different age group. So I think it will be interesting to see whether we can see the trend 
in the different age group. Is the older really need more um they have a many for the caregiving. So this is the way we create the categorical variable. So we use the in range to to define the age range we want to use in the in this uh, age category. So the first category will be age 60 to 64 and so on. And then we define the um, the value label, and then we assign the value to that new variable we create. So far, so good. So again, we will do the same thing to combine the RC any, whether we see any care for ADL or IDL, and then we combine the weight. We have an individual weight for all three studies. So these are the last variable we are going to create. So we want to see, we want to combine the ADL IDL difficulties and then just create one overall difficulty. So this R2018 ADL IAL is a combination of the ADL and an IDL. So what's the range for this variable then? Nine. Very good. Very good. Zero to nine because ADL is five, IDL is four. And then we also create a, a binary indicator, whether they have any difficulty. So if range from one to nine, this variable will be one because they have any they have difficulty. And then zero means they don't have any difficulty. This variable will be really easy to use if you want to run the multivariate analysis. You just use a larger model and then you can use a zero one to, to um, perform the multivariate analysis. And then to help to, um, we also create, we define a value label for that, and then we assign the new value label for the, the any difficulty variable. So let's go back, let's run some state call. So here, since we have pause here, you just type as it. You will run the next step of the part, the code. <clears throat> so this is the frequency of the new H uh, category variable we just created. So you can see our age group is um, about thirty percent in the six two sixty four. And then 25% on the second group, 20, uh, 65 to 69. So this is just the code to combine the, the weight and then the rule and urban. So here's a code to create the energy code. So let's do a tab. So you can type by sport, country, and then by the any difficulty variable. So here it will show the frequency by each of the country. So you can see in India, we have about 46% of people has difficulty. In Mexico, we have about 23%. And then in China, we have about 34%. But those are the raw estimate. We did not apply weight yet. So later on, I will show you the population estimate. 
Any question? Because I'm so good. Too easy for you guys? So now we are going to the cross country analysis. So the first step we need to apply the weights as we have some discussion about the weight. And then I'll show you um, how we combine the weight and then have a stata as a SVY command you can assign the weight and straight out to in your, um, into your analysis. And then the next, we will run some univariate analysis of the disability of privates. And last, we will run some multivariate analysis of disability of privates. So how do we apply the weight in stata? So we will, first we need to use SVY stat. So this command, it will tell Stata what's the way you're going to use and then what's the strata. So in our case, we already combined the way from all three different countries. So our variable is our 2018 WTISP. And then the strata will be our country indicator. So now we want to see the proportion of people who have any difficulty over each country. It will be interesting to see like which country has the highest um, prevalence of having difficulty. So we will use the SVY command, so SVY semicolon, and then use the proportion command to calculate the weighted estimate for the people ha having any difficulty. And then we're using the over option, tell the data we want to calculate this by all by di three different countries. So let's go back to data. Let's run this. So this is the SVY set command, and you can see this. The data already tell you this you no know, missing and then straight out is a country. Okay, so this is our first result. Because we are using the um, the sample data set, so it's not really correct. But just like give you an idea that like how the how can you read the the data output. So here it will tell you the subpopulation. Subpart means uh, subpopulation. So first in India, two is Mexico, and three is China. And then in this, show you the estimate of proportion. We will only look at the difficulty here. The second, the second portion here. And then the this proportion will show you the weighted estimate of the population estimate for each country. The people, the parents, the people has the, uh, any idea or idea of difficulty. And here is the 95% confidence interval. Okay. So we can also look at a graph. So I generate some graph for you. So this is using the real. Um, survey data. So as you can see here, the um, the Indian um, has about, I would say 20, almost 30% of the people has uh, disab disability difficulty. And then the China ranked as second, compared with three, and then Mexico is the lowest. So next we can also look at, so the previous one we only look at by country. And now we are interested to look at within the country, is there any gender difference? So we are over by country and gender together. And then run the same command. So let's go back to data. So here you can see, it show all the six different combinations. First, 
first two is Indian and then Indian man, Indian woman. The third and fourth is Mexican man and Mexican woman. The last two group is China, men and women. And then you can see the proportion estimate here. In this example, even though it's not correct, and then you can see the one, which one is the highest? It's actually the second one, right? So the second one is actually the Indian woman. It's the highest. Proportion is the, the difficulty, the prevalence. And then the second highest is Mexican woman. So in overall, you can say woman in this output. Your explanation is the woman has a, overall has a higher weighted prevalence. Has difficult, they have a difficulty. So we can also look at graphically. So this is a graph by country, also by gender. So this is really, um, you can see the trend here. So Indian woman has the highest disability purpose. So any question? No? I guess. So after applying weights, uh, there is a population size that is coming out. So what does that indicate? Should it indicate the total population of the, uh, of the country in that age group that we are considering? So if you go back to your statement. Now there, uh, there is a population size that is coming up there. There is a population size that is coming up in the research. Three million. Yeah. So that indicates the total, actual total population of that age group yeah. that we are considering. So this is a this is an example data, so it will be... Yeah, this is an example, yeah. Because so, it's after applying all the weight, so this is the... So this is what it will give in real data. Right? Yes. Any question? So the last example I'm going to give is the multivariate analysis. So as I mentioned, we create the any difficulty is a zero and one, and then we can fit a, a larger model to see, to find an estimate. And then we think, and then we want to see whether there is a gender difference. And then also uh, we want to see in difference in age group. So sorry, I should put this it should be the age category, not the R, uh, age Y. So in the code is correct, but just like run in the slide. And I also want to see within the, those demographic will be uh, important uh, factor to affect uh, uh, any difficulty. And then also we bring to the rural urban and then we also add the country indicator as a covariance. Let's run the state code. So as you see the output here first, and in the model I also um, show the odds ratio instead of the estimate. So sometimes you want, some people want to see the estimate, but some sometimes it's easier to explain by the odds ratio. So uh, compared to men, to, so our uh, reference group for the gender is male. So you can see the woman has a higher, higher possibility to have a higher um, risk, I say higher risk to getting the, um, to have a uh, disability. And then as you see really interesting, really interesting for the age group here, 
the older school has a lot higher odds ratio compared to the younger school. Yes. And you can see the trend is really by the age increase and you have a higher um, risk have a um, difficulty. And then the education, because it's all, um, only 100, I mean, it's a, our example data set is not really correct here. But it's just like get your idea like how you can run your multivariate analysis. Any question? So when you uh, get the real data set, you can also, so in the program folder, I have another program. You can run that one and then you will read in the real data set. And then you can run the analysis to see the really national estimate because it apply all the way from three different, all the different study and then the result will be up to the national estimate. So here is just an example, I show you how to run and then just give you an idea. It's not really like, may not be a real analysis. So we'll be finished early. So if you want to, let's give some time for your to for you to practice the program and then to redo the program. So you can close this one if you want to rerun again to see code uh, like session by session. You can close this one, let's close that one. And then again, you can open this program. And you can run it session by session. So you just like practice and see is there anything that you don't understand or you have something. And then in my program, I also generate a log file. So as you can see, if you are able to run the program successfully, you will generate this log file in your folder. And then you can open the log file using any of the text editor. It will show you the result that we just read. are done with exercise, you can also look into the COBOL folder. And then just to review that what I have been showing you guys, all the variable that we created among these three study, and then it's any variable you have a question, you want to ask us, right now will be a good time. So after you receive, since you already have a harmonized last C, and then for the MHAS, you might be able to get it, and then for the Charles, after you receive the Charles data, so you can all put into this data folder. And then go back to the program folder, you can run this, not the underscore N100, but the regular example underscore PGN.2. You will run the same program using the real harmonized data set, and then create the national estimate. Institutional Rules Explorers is one of our newest initiatives, um, which I'll go into detail in a little bit. And then we also can search for publications based on the HRS Family of Surveys. 
And then we also have harmonized data, which again, I'll get into in a little bit more detail later on in the talk. And so first is our study overviews. So in our study overviews, we provide a link to the cohort profile paper, um, if it has been written and it's available. Um, we also introduce the study sampling framework. So here I've provided an example of what the study overview page looks like for the Mexican Health and Aging Study, which is also called MHOS for short. Um, so here you're able to see the sampling frame where we see the age eligibility is 50 years or older, um, how many people were interviewed, whether their spouse was interviewed and what age their spouse has to be. Um, we highlight the timing of the core interviews and the different collection periods. And then we also provide information on other types of surveys that were fielded as part of the study. Um, so in addition to the core interview that is administered in MHOS, they also administer an end-of-life interview, a health assessment, different biomarker collections, as well as a cognitive assessment. So the study overview pages, if you toggle over to the next tab, also provides more information on the sample. So here you're able to see the response by wave for the original sample, wave three, as well as wave five. And then we also show you the list of types of administrative linkages included in the data. Um, so here at the bottom of the screen, you can see the different administrative linkages that are available for waves one, two, and three. And then lastly, the study overview pages, we, we uh, include links to obtain all of the available study data, including restricted data, so that you can be able to access it. And then we also have links to obtain the harmonized versions of the study data. So the harmonized data is user-friendly data sets that are research ready. So we've created all of these variables um, for you so that you can quickly conduct your analysis and not have to create the variables yourself. <coughs> We also provide details on survey questionnaires. So here at the top, you can see that we have uh, survey questionnaires for the core interview, end of life, life history, the self-assessment, if there's a self-completion questionnaire, as well as the harmonized cognitive assessment protocol. And so we include um, the order of the modules and the order of the questions within the modules. So here you can easily navigate the different questionnaires and the different sections within those questionnaires. And here we also provide flowcharts. Um, so as you all know, not every question is administered to every respondent. We have survey skip patterns. Um, and so this allows you to visual, visually see what questions are asked to which respondents. And so here we provide, it's kind of small, but here we're providing a skip pattern for um, high blood pressure. So the interviewer first asks, you know, have you ever been told by your doctor that you have high blood pressure or hypertension? Um, if they say no, it moves on to the next question about diabetes, but if they say yes, they're actually asked an additional question about whether or not they take medication. And so that medication question is only asked to those respondents who actually report having high blood pressure. And so these are details that are really important to understand in your research so that you know why certain variables may have missing values. We also provide very, uh, a lot of detail on the individual survey questionnaires. So if you uh, search a question, we provide a description, the exact question text as it was asked in the questionnaire, and we also include all of the answer types and the exact values of how that uh, variable is formatted in the data. So for example, here we're asking a self-reported uh, health question, and we have um, coded it as one if it was excellent, all the way down to five if they reported the poor health. And we also have a keyword search. And so as I mentioned, these surveys are very vast in the type of information that they have. So it's really important to be able to search for exactly what you're looking for. Um, and so here we've provided an example of smoke. So if you're interested in if there's a var variable for smoking status, you can type in the keyword search bar smoked. And then you can also filter your search by the exact study that you're interested in. You can select multiple studies if you're interested in seeing if this variable is available in different studies across the world. You can also filter by the year in which the study was conducted. And, and your search results will appear here at the bottom. 
Um, and again, it is a little bit hard to see, but um, Sandy will actually be providing a hands-on demonstration of this after lunch, so you'll be able to actually practice on your own and be able to use the search, uh, search bar. Um, but here the results are basically showing that Elsa in 2002 actually did have a variable for have you ever smoked cigarettes, and it shows the different um, value labels for the answer options. And so this is a, just a great way to be able to search uh, the questionnaires uh, fairly quickly. And we also have a topic search. So if you are interested in just a broad topic rather than a specific keyword, you can also search for that as well. Um, you can limit your search by harmonized data set. So if you are interested in looking in the raw data, you want to know what's available in the harmonized data, you can actually filter that search as well. And then you can view results from the harmonized data set. And here we have typed in the keyword of number of children. So we want to know, you know what harmonized data sets actually contain this type of information. Um, and then we can see here at the results um, all of the different harmonized data sets that this variable or this topic is available in. <laughs> um, concordance across surveys will be really important for conducting cross-country uh, cross analyses. Um, and so all of these uh, are domain-specific comparison tables showing which studies um, have this uh, variable or this topic of interest. And so here we provided an example of family demographics. Um, and as you can see in the very first line, you probably can't read it, but it says number of people in the household. Um, so we can see that number of people in the household is actually available in all of the studies that are listed here. But as you go down to look at uh, number of deceased children, we start to see cross-study differences. So not all of the studies actually ask about number of deceased children, and so here we've indicated very clearly which studies ask this question and which studies don't. So that when you're actually searching for a, val a variable, you'll know whether or not it's available in that study. Um, and then we also have documentation and presentations. So we have domain-specific user guides, which provides an overview of all of the information for that very specific research domain that, are, that is available across the studies. And so we work with experts in the field to be able to um, write up these documentations. And as Professor Lee uh, mentioned before, we have presentations of all of our workshops that we have previously conducted. Um, so for example, we have um, introductions to different studies, uh, we have uh, different analyses that have been conducted to teach you how to conduct different cross-country analyses. And all of the PowerPoints, all of the code and presentations is um, accessible once you uh, register for the gateway. Uh, graphs and tables is a really cool uh, feature that the gateway has so that you actually don't have to download the data to be able to start creating graphs and start looking at trends. So you can start, uh, select from over 100 different topics in 29 countries in 13 years, um, and you can filter the data at the individual or the household level. Um, it produces population estimates, and the weights are actually already applied to these uh, graphs. And so you can view it as a graph, a table, or a map, and you can create these graphs without actually having to download the data. And so this could actually be a good starting point um, as you start to think about your research questions um, and start to look at trends of the data. And then you can easily down your, download your results in a variety of different formats. <coughs> so here we provided an example of how you can use the survey statistics in, using the graphs and tables feature and compare it with contextual data that's available. And so here we're looking at individual earnings across the years using the HRS study in the United States. And we've actually stratified it by different years of education. So the top bar on the, uh, the blue bar on the top is for college education. Um, the middle bar is high school or vocational level. And the red bar at the bottom is those who have received uh, less than high school education. And so here, as you can see, the US individual earnings are actually increasing at a greater pace for those with a college education or more. And we can actually compare that to contextual data we have on the US um, GDP per capita. So again, here you can link the survey data to contextual data to see the different trends um, and the environment in which the participant is living in. 
So the Institutional Rules Explorer is one of the newest initiatives of the Gateway. Um, it allows researchers to understand the policy in place at the time of the survey, uh, and then the policy details are collected and indexed by country and by year. Um, so this can help better draw, uh, help you to draw conclusions about the person's health and what policies were in place at the time of that report. Um, so currently, the Explore is focused on uh, public pension policies, which are available currently in nine countries. And then over the next few years, the team is looking to add more countries and eventually cover most of the countries in the HRS study. And so the team is also in the process of uh, making a collecting and making available long-term long care policies. And then the full details of each policy are, for the country is also distributed in standalone documents. So if you go on the website, you can download these documents, um, which includes tables and formulas um, for all of these different uh, pension policies that are uh, collected. Um, and as also Professor Z mentioned earlier, uh, we can search publications based on surveys. And so here, um, you can find publications uh, by research focus, and so you can select from survey topic, survey or topic. You can also search by title, author, source, and year. Um, and so then you can download the citations in a variety of formats and start to conduct your literature reviews and get a broader sense of what research has already been done on your topic of interest in the field. Uh, so the remainder of the talk is actually going to be talking about harmonized data and what's available to you. Um, so harmonized data are created to provide comparable research ready variables. Um, so the variables are defined as similarly as possible across all waves and across all studies to allow us to make those comparisons. Um, and each data set combines all waves from each study. Um, so everything is within one data set so you don't actually have to worry about merging on information from different waves. And each individual is one record. And we've uh, constructed these uh, variables to, be in to have intuitive names. So for example, in the first one we see the variable R1 work, and that just uh, indicates whether the respondent is currently working in wave one. And then we also have spouse versions um, of most of the variables, and those are also named to be intuitive. So S2 work means whether the respondent's spouse is currently working in wave two. And we have um, also study specific variable names. Uh, so while the uh, questionnaires are designed to be comparable across studies. There are some instances where one study may ask the question in a different way because of different cultural contexts in different countries. And so we like to be transparent that the variables are not directly comparable. So we put an underscore C um, for Charles, for example, to indicate that this variable isn't exactly comparable to the HRS. There's something different about the way the question was asked. So for example, R1 LBRF underscore C um, indicates the respondent's labor force status and wave one of Charles. And then as I mentioned, the underscore C indicates that something was different about that variable. And here it was because the response scale was different. So the response scale in Charles was different from that in HRS to account for different uh, you know, cultural appropriateness of that question. Um, and then the variables have also been built to account for survey skip patterns, and I'll provide an example of what that looks like um, later on. Um, this is an example of a simple harmonization that we have conducted across uh, two different studies. So here the question is about whether the respondent has ever smoked. So the harmonized variable is RW smoke F, which is just whether the respondent has smoked. And share on the left, we actually have to only take one uh, question into account. So in share, which is the survey in Europe, um, is has the respondent ever smoked daily? So if they answer one yes, we would harmonize it and code it as a one in the harmonized variable. Um, if they answer no, then we would carb harmonize it and code it as a zero for no. However, in LC, which is the study in Brazil, we actually have to take two questions into account to create the harmonized variable. So the first question is, do you smoke currently? And so the answers are yes daily, yes less than daily, or no. So if they answer yes daily or yes less than daily, we code it as a yes in the harmonized variable. 
And then respondents, if they answer no to do you currently smoke, we then ask, have you ever smoked in the past? And again, the answer options are yes daily, yes less than daily, or no. So if they answer yes daily or yes less than daily, we code it as a yes in the harmonized variable. And if they reported that they never smoked, then we just say that no, they've never smoked in the harmonized variable. And so this is just a simple example of how questions, even though they're asked slightly differently in different surveys, we can still create one harmonized variable so that it's com actually comparable across the different studies. <coughs> So this is actually an example of a complex harmonization. So this is just showing you all of the different raw variables that needed to be considered to create one harmonized variable for household assets in JSTAR, which is the HRS study in Japan. So I'm not going to go into the details of how this was created, but we do provide documentation because, again, we want to be as transparent as possible. So when you have a harmonized variable, you can read the documentation to see exactly how it was created um, and all of the variables that went into creating this harmonized variable. And so one of the reasons that we like to have this as a resource for researchers is so that researchers don't actually have to go through this complicated process. We want you to be able to have research-ready variables so that you can focus on the analysis and not have to focus on uh, the harmonization. And so these are the code books where we actually house all of that uh, documentation. So in these code books, we introduce the harmonization project and study to provide you with more of a background. Uh, we have overviews of the survey timing, the survey design, and the sampling framework. So a lot of the information that is provided in the study overviews pages is also provided in these code books. Uh, we discuss the weighting and imputation strategies. And we also discuss the different harmonization processes. So that complicated JSTAR variable, we document exactly how that was created in these code books. And then we also divide the code books into different sections based off research domains so that you can go and find exactly what you're looking for. So for example, you can see the different research domains of demographics, health, insurance, cognition, and so on for all of these topics. <coughs> In the codebooks, we also summarize each variable, so you'll be able to see what the distribution is um, for the different variables, and also the different special missing codes that are assigned based off survey skip patterns. So here we're showing um, the smoke ever variable for waves one through, uh, one through seven for both the respondent and the spouse. And as you can see, a special missing don't know uh, was assigned in wave one to 11 respondents who answered don't know to the question, have you ever smoked? And then we can also see that 174 respondents were actually skipped and not answered, not, uh, not asked this question because the questionnaire was conducted by proxy. And then in the how constructed section of the code book, this is where you'll find a detailed description of how the variable was actually created and we provide a description of the actual special missing code. So if you don't know what a dot P means or what a dot X means, you can actually go here and it'll describe exactly what uh, those codes mean. And then lastly, we provide, um, we highlight the differences uh, between the waves of the study and also between um, the study and HRS. And so as uh, surveys conduct each wave, they may not ask the questions in the similar way, wave by wave. They may adjust their questionnaire um, by wave. And so we let you know if there were any cross-wave differences. So here in ELSA, we actually do see that the ever smoked variable was asked differently across different waves. But we actually don't see any differences between ELSA and the RAND HRS. So here, uh, that's where you'll find that information. And then lastly, we list all of the variables from the original data set um, that was used in the creation of the harmonized variable. So if you're interested in seeing um, what variables went into using that, you can uh, reference this and we list them by wave so that you can easily search for that variable you're interested in. So these are all the core harmonized data files that are available on the gateway. Um, and I would encourage you to look at those study overview pages um, if you're interested in more information to provide a very detailed background. 
And these are the end of life harmonized data files that are available. Um, so as mentioned earlier, these files are built off of the exit interviews, uh, which are conducted with a close relative or caretaker um, after the time of the respondent's death. Um, and it really includes invaluable information about the circumstances of the respondent's death, um, information about from the last interview to the time of their death, um, and also information about the respondent's estate. And so we have created these end of life data, harmonized data files for HRS, MHOS, ELSA, SHARE, and also CLOSA. And JSTAR and Charles are currently being built. And so we will uh, keep you up to date of when these data files will be available. Um, so we also have life history data sets, which was of interest before the break. Um, and so these are built off of the life history interviews during which the respondent provides retrospective reports of the entire life of, um, of their entire life, including childhood, education, job history, uh, marriage, childbirth, and also health history. And again, I would encourage you to visit the um, study overview pages to find more information about the different modules that were available, the, differ the different questions that were asked in these surveys. Um, so the ELSA and SHARE are currently available on the Gateway, um, and the Charles Life History is currently being built. And then finally, we have the Harmonized Cognitive Assessment Protocol Harmonized Data Files. Um, so these were built which met, uh, based off of a battery, which measures a range of key demographic domains um, affected by cognitive aging. So these different domains include attention, memory, executive function, language and the visuospatial domain. And these were also, um, the surveys were built to be comparable across studies uh, around the world. And so the data set that's available right now on the gateway is the Harmonized Lassie Dad, which was the study conducted here in India. Uh, wave one has been completed, and then wave two is actually, um, we're, tra we're training our interviewers right now for wave two. Um, and then the harmonized HRS, HCAP, and ELSA HCAP are under review, so they're not available yet, but will hopefully be available soon. And then the MexCog, ChileCog, and Charles HCAP are currently being built. Um, so for obtaining harmonized data, Sandy is going to show you how to actually download the data from our website. Um, so you can either directly download from our website or go to the uh, study page to download the data. And we've provided data access instructions for all of these different surveys. Um, so if you, you know, later on decide you want to study um, a study that we actually don't go over today, you can go to our website, download the instructions so that you can easily have access to the data. Um, and in some cases, the data files are created um, by users based off of the code that is provided by the gateway. And so you all have, most of you have registered for the Gateway, um, but if you haven't yet, um, you would register at g2aging.org and just click the register button at the right side of the screen. Um, enter your information and you'll easily uh, be signed up. And any uh, analysis or information used from the Gateway, we would request this citation uh, be used um, in your papers. And so today's workshop after lunch is going to be a cross-country analysis between India, Mexico, and China. So that's the Longitudinal Aging Study in India, the Mexican Health and Aging Study, and the China Health and Retirement Longitudinal Study. And so again, Sandy is going to go into more detail um, on these different studies um, and how to conduct the cross-country analysis, but I'll just briefly go over um, some of the information. Um, so here in India, the Longitudinal Aging Study in India was a cohort study of over 72,000 respondents. Uh, wave 1 has been completed, and the sample is 45 years and older and spouses of any age. And it is representative of the nation as well as 35 states and union territories. And in Mexico, it's a longitudinal study of over 18,000 uh, older adults, and they've actually completed five waves and their sample is 50 years and older and spouses of any age. And then lastly, um, China has a cohort of over 20,000 older adults and they've completed four waves. And their sample is also 45 and older with spouses of any age. 
Um, and as you can see from the survey topics at the bottom, they all cover a wide range of different uh, research domains so that you can conduct cross-country analyses and can start to compare uh, the health of different countries. And so to learn more, um, I encourage you to visit our website to, so that you can start accessing all of this, these different resources uh, for your research. We have a help desk, which is help at g2aging.org. So if you have any questions about the data sets, um, any questions about any of the resources that are available on the website, please email this help desk and we will respond to help you out. And we have a documentations tab, which shows you the past webinars that we've done, the different trainings, um, different trainings on analyses that we've done. So you can watch the videos, you can download the PowerPoints, and you can also access the code that was uh, given during those presentations. And lastly, we have a news and blogs tab. So we really try and keep researchers up to date with new um, resources that we have available. And so I would follow the, the blogs tab so that you can see overviews of uh, new data sets that have been available, new papers that have come out, just so that you can stay up to date on current research in the field.